Today's guest is Sandy Weiner, and Sandy is the founder of Last First Date and The Woman of Value. She's an internationally known TEDx speaker, dating and relationship coach. So we're going to talk about some dating. She's going to share. She's going to be very open about her dating life, which is really fun. She's a women's empowerment coach and author and podcast host, clearly very busy. Uh, she's also the author of Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And her work has been published in many publications, including Mind Body Green, Psychology Today, The Good Men Project, and the Chicago Tribune. She's also the host of two podcasts. And I was recently a guest on her one called Last First Date Radio. And such a fun name. And we talk about how she came up with that name and what it means. And she also has a podcast called the Woman of Value podcast. And Sandy believes that it's never too late to have the life and love you want. So I want to also share that she is very soft spoken in the beginning. And she is, so she's very articulate and very clear in how she speaks. But I say, I say that though, because it just gets into such a interesting, lively conversation. So it's almost like it starts really almost slow, but then we get into the juicy, the juicy of her sharing her dating stories. And I had such a fun conversation with her. Uh, it's not so, so often that we talk about dating in this late stage of life. Uh, and so it's so much fun. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed getting to know her better through the podcast interview. So enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Not Your Average Lives. And today my guest is Sandy Weiner. And Sandy and I met through uh, podcasting shares. I don't know how we met, but anyways, welcome to the show, Sandy. I'm really excited to have you here. I'm excited to be on the other side of the microphone today. <laughs> yes, yes, because you interviewed me uh, last time we spoke. So I am just going to jump right into letting you introduce yourself and your, you know, who you are, what you do, uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. Sure. So I do a lot of things. I've, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, I am a relationship coach, a dating coach, a communications expert, and a woman's empowerment coach. Um, I run two companies. The uh, One of them is called Last First Date, and the other one is called The Woman of Value. And both of them really at their core are about empowerment of women. So whether you're running a business and you wanna be more empowered in how you show up in the world, or you wanna be more empowered in how you show up in your dating life and communicate clearly and confidently and set boundaries. So I have tons of courses that I created around boundaries and communication and dating skills. And I wrote a book called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. I am the host of two podcasts, Last First Date Radio and the Woman of Value podcast. And um, lots of other things. I'm also an artist and a mom of three grown children and three grandchildren. So I, like you, am not your average grandma. <laughs> yeah, we share that. That's awesome. So, so, so busy. How do you manage to do two podcasts? That's a lot of, uh, of recording. And, and do you interview, I know with the last first date, that was, you interviewed me on that and that was really fun. So is the woman of value, you also interview people? I do. So when I started the woman of value podcast, it was weekly and I quickly realized that I couldn't do two weekly shows and run a coaching practice and write and have a family and do everything else that I wanted to do. So now the woman of value podcast is monthly and that show has a very clear format as opposed to Last First State Radio, which is more about just really getting to know people who are, who are experts in dating or relationships, um, have their own great stories to tell about dating later in life. And the other one is really about women who are creating positive change and making a difference in the world. And so we talk about pivotal moments in their lives, kind of like you do also. And what kind of prompted them to step more fully into their value and how they're, what they're doing today and 
there's a lightning round and it's, it's really a very fun format. So it's very different for me and it's, they both are really exciting and I get to meet awesome people. Yes. Yeah. And I remember, cause I think one of the questions you asked me was, you know, when was your last first date or, and it was so funny cause I figured out, which I shared that my last first date was in, even though I have a second husband that I married 12 years ago, my last first date was in January of 1980. So, and that's because, you know, I, I called up an old boyfriend. So well, yeah. I don't, it was several dates, but it was just 27 years later. So that's really fun. I love that like play and, and how you serve people uh, and encourage them. So, and you were telling me you're going on a, a, a date. So let's talk about your backstory, how you got to do these, these podcasts obviously aren't uh, from your twenties because we didn't have podcasts back then. So, so tell me about you in the past and what got you into coaching and uh yeah and how you ended up uh, dating again uh, yeah so <laughs> i would say that it it's, goes back to who i was as a teenager i looked at my yearbook from 12th grade from my senior yearbook and the quote was Andy is the go-to person for all my issues. You know, she's the one we go to because she's so grounded. And so I was always that person, but I didn't focus on that fully. And so in college, I studied art therapy for a while, trying to combine my love of art and my love of, of therapeutic practices. But I didn't like art therapy per se. It felt very um, interpretive, like you would have somebody draw a picture and let's say there were three windows and you'd say oh that's because you have three children in your family and more what I love is like having people look at the windows and look at the picture and tell me what they feel and how it affects them and how other people see the picture and so anyway I, I also was working in very difficult situations in in this the psychiatric hospital that was like a private hospital. And it really freaked me out because my life was probably two steps away from being in a psychiatric ward. I think when you're in your twenties and you're figuring out who you are. And I also came from a home with mental illness. It was too close to home. It was like, I don't know, like those people look kind of like me and I don't really want to be like that. So that's interesting because it's clearly you wanted to do that probably because of your background with experiencing mental illness in your in your household so you wanted to help people kind of recover from that or get past that or live with that yeah I think that had a, a ton of influence in who I became I think it was just always being also the peacekeeper in the family there was a lot of chaos and screaming and yelling in my family and so I was the grounded one and my parents also didn't have good boundaries. And so they told me too many things. And so I'm sure people can relate to that. And so I became the kind of steady Eddie in the family. And did they split or did they stay? Together? Yeah, they split. Okay. They waited until we were all out of the house, which was torture. And I mean, I, I sat my mom down when I was 16 and I said, why don't you leave my father? And she was like, what? And I said, it's really hard to live in this environment, mom. Like, you're obviously unhappy. Just leave. And she was like, oh, it's not easy to leave. You know? And it wasn't in those days. So I was 29 when they split and I was getting married. And so trying to manage the two of them, again, because they had to be managed, they did not get along and they made it our problem. And so my, I did, that was my memory of my wedding is what trying to make sure my parents oh. weren't going to kill each other. And how do we, how do we keep the peace at my wedding? Yeah. So, so I had a lot of that going on in my life. Yeah. And uh, I just liked it. What, what came up for me when you said that was women stay for the children when sometimes leaving for the children is the better choice. And Absolutely. I felt like my kids were grown, so I, I can't really speak to my own experience, but mm -hmm. what you, you, the gift you do give your kids when you're doing that is that they see an empowered woman and you speak to empowerment, that you take your power back when you leave a bad marriage. And that is the example that you give your children. It's not the example of a failed marriage. And we always want to, you know, beat ourselves up because we have a failed marriage. It's, 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 you know, so one of the, best thing somebody said to me when I went through my divorce is 
you don't have a failed marriage. You had a successful 25, you know, you like kept it together for 25 years and we got along. So it wasn't one of those horrible, like fighting all the time type of thing. So, yeah. So we have to just change that uh, perspective on, on what we perceive as a failure. And then what, and what are we really, what example are we really giving our kids? You know, I so agree. I mean, you know, I begged my mother because I hated living in that environment. And I think that we don't realize that our kids really will benefit if we can handle the post-divorce well. So that's, that's another part of the story that I'll get to in a minute, but. So you married at 29. Right. I married at 29. Um, I had four kids um, and early on in the marriage, we had crisis. Um, So my my first pregnancy ended in miscarriage, which was devastating. And then I had a child born with a genetic disease. And so my husband and I really started to go in separate directions when that happened. He, he, it is tough. It's tough on any marriage, but especially in a marriage where we handled crisis very differently. And so my first thought was, what can we do for him to help him through my child to help him have the best care as possible and get the right diagnosis. And my husband just completely shut down and why me? And I was trying to be a good person. Why do bad things happen to me? And I'm like, that didn't even occur to me. I think growing up also in chaotic environment with things that weren't so great prepared me to have any, anything happen. I mean, I never walked around expecting everything to be perfect. And so children are born healthy and children are born unhealthy. And I was prepared in a way to deal with it. And so I became an expert in his disease. I was the one who advocated for a different diagnosis. He was misdiagnosed at birth and unfortunately it was fatal and genetic. And so he passed away at the age of five Mm. of a brain tumor and my husband really shut down. And so I still stayed for 23 years in this marriage, but it was like, I, my personality was I soldier on. It sounds like you had a lot of the same type of, you know, ways of dealing yeah, with things. But I have to say, I never experienced a tragic loss like that. It's just, just heart, heart wrenching. So uh, I actually have one of my students and she has lost five, she lost five children um, oh. from a genetic disease. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that, and I didn't even know that until after we were, you know, in, involved in coaching for a while. And then she shared a, a documentary that she had done on it. And it was like, oh, I, I can't imagine surviving, you know, from that, that amount of loss. But, you know, you, you know, that's, that's what you do. Soldier on. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, but you have more children. So, so when I had did they... three, I had three more children. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know it was genetic until the second one was in utero. So I was already, I don't know, like four or five months pregnant with Rebecca, my second child, when I found out it was genetic. So every pregnancy was scary. I mean, I, we had genetic testing. We, we couldn't tell a hundred percent whether the child had it or not until the child was born. So, uh, cause they needed blood to test the blood. They didn't have good testing in those days. So mm-hmm. um, it was scary and I took a risk each time. I'm glad I went on and had healthy children. I was lucky. And did you wait um, until your first son passed or no. did you have another child before he died? I had two before he died. Wow, you had your hands And full. the third, the fourth, um, my fourth child was, her testing came back ambiguous and they told me to abort her. I, <gasps> they said probably 50-50 chance and you should probably abort and try again. And, and every time I got pregnant, it was a one in four chance of having this disease. So it's I wasn't- chills. oh my goodness. Yeah, and, I, and also like I didn't take the pregnancy lightly. You know, it's not easy for everybody to get pregnant. It's, there's so many risks involved. And I was already older. I was, I was 38 when I gave birth to her. So we were told that the only way we could find out whether she really has it is to wait 20 weeks, which is halfway through your pregnancy, and then have an umbilical blood test of her umbilical blood. And I, I actually had an abortion scheduled. I, um, I, I have a whole speech on this that I did for a Toastmasters contest because it was, it was important for me to talk about abortion in a way that is putting a human faith on it 
that not every abortion is because some teenager got pregnant because they were negligent and didn't use birth control, but there are people who have these genetic diseases and have these extenuating circumstances where abortion is, is, is you know, it's just the way of avoiding having more children die. I mean, it's like really, it's a horrible decision to have to make, honestly. And as I think it was the weekend before the abortion, I had this epiphany. Well, I went for another ultrasound. I said, I've got to to see. And it, there was, it wasn't going to be proof of anything, but I, I wanted to see this child. And nothing about what I saw pointed in the direction of disease. And I just- Yeah. And let me interrupt because how, how old are you again? I'm 65. So yeah. So we're similar in age. W- ultrasounds were not a th- like a big thing. Like I had an ultrasound only because the, my first one wasn't measuring to where they thought she should be measuring. So they did an ultrasound only because they were concerned. It's not, it right. wasn't a normal thing to have an ultrasound done. So yeah. yeah, not like today where you can actually see the whole picture of the baby in 3D. I mean, it's like crazy. So my, my first, Avi, my first child who died, we had an ultrasound because I was three weeks late and they were like, let's just see. And they could, they, it was so rudimentary. It was like this big white blob. So with my last child, Sarah, it was, you had to schedule this. You had to say, I want an ultrasound. And so I had to go into Manhattan and, you know, it was like a big ordeal. So you probably have a good reason, you know, to to have that. My next door neighbor, and this is another side story. My next door neighbor (laughs) had a baby uh, and she had a boy and she was wanted to have a girl. She did all these things like drank coffee and did like <laughs> right. she did, did all these things before she got pregnant. And then she had a sonogram and she found out she was having a second boy. And so she even went to therapy and then <laughs> a girl came. It was a girl oh, after all that oh, so with really funny. fat, rolly legs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they were, it, it was very rudimentary back then. Right. Who knew like what was really going on anyway. So I, I didn't have proof, but I just, I had this epiphany that I have to cancel the abortion and wait. And that having the abortion at whatever, it was a couple of weeks before I was going to find out what she, you know, whether she was really healthy or not. The abortion I was going to have at that stage was like a late abortion and it would have been painful to have to go through that. But it was, it was really the pain of knowing that I aborted a healthy child was greater than the pain of what I would have to go through to have an abortion. And so I said, okay, I need to do what's right for the child and find out the truth. And so I waited and it was like, I remember that day when I got the call that she was healthy and it was like, it was, it was just that mother's intuition, follow your, follow your intuition, which intuition is a big part of why I became a coach. And so we'll get to the coaching part in a second. Yeah. So, you know, I had, I had these children, I had a difficult marriage and I finally had the courage to leave Uh, after 20, 20 years, I asked him for a divorce and it took us three years to actually get divorced. And in that process, I started to look at who I had, who I had become in this marriage. I had lost parts of me. And one of them was this, this part of me that loved to work with people. So I had been doing art and I had been helping my husband who was a comedian. We had a TV show on Nickelodeon together. We, we had a really exciting professional life, but it was really his professional life. And there was a point when he said to me after we shot this, this show on Nickelodeon and, he, and I was on it and you know both physically and behind the scenes as one of the head writers and did some directing and music and sound effects and did all this really cool stuff. And he said, your dreams come true. You were on national television. And I said, that wasn't my dream. It was yours. Like it was exciting, but it wasn't my dream. And I just didn't know what my dream was yet. Yeah. So that that's so interesting. Come. That's so interesting. Cause yeah, same thing. Cause we, we lose sight and don't even think our dreams are important. And we so busy supporting our spouses and our children. Yeah. And we don't sometimes know what those dreams are. Like that's, I'm sure some of the work you do is to help people find what is that? Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. is that part of you that is inside somewhere and let's find it and shine some light on it. And so really going back to the breadcrumbs of who was I and what do, what really lights me up and what can I do that will not only 
bring me value, but will bring others value. So doing yeah, because when you when you support when you're in your way that you're supporting your husband, it was almost like your husband, the the byproduct of his work was your work. Mm -hmm. So when you split up, it was like okay, that wasn't my work; that was his work. Now what? So you were forty nine, I guess when. This I was cl- about 50 when I finally yeah. left. Yeah. So, wow. so what happened was there were things that I had done in the marriage through the work I did that gave me confidence to do some of the work I do today, like writing. I never thought of myself as a writer and now I write. And also being in front of a camera and being in, a mic- in front of a microphone, I was always the backstage person doing all the stuff in the background. And I think when you have the courage to step up and say, okay, I don't want to hide anymore. And most of the hiding was because I had a fear of judgment and not being perfect, which is a big reason most of us stay small. And when, so I started studying coaching because coaching really fit my personality. It was like, I was going to go into social work, psychology, and someone sent me this thing about coaching, which I had never heard of. You were coaching your mother at 16. I was. (laughs) You're right. And I, and so it really is like, oh, that's what I do. And, and it's also, it's short-term training. It's goal oriented. It's not spending a ton of time just diagnosing and sitting and listening, but there's, there's accountability and there's homework and, and I thrive on that. So I knew that was going to suit my personality and also the creativity around coaching, because if you're doing some traditional form of therapy, there's not a whole lot of creativity and you can bring your personality. So with, with coaching, I was doing art workshops for a while where I had people do what I call process painting and they, I would do a guided meditation and then they would just paint their feelings. And it didn't have anything to do with being a good artist. It was just paint what's going on inside and then put your painting down in, in my kitchen. And then everybody would come in and stand in front of the painting that spoke to them and tell, tell everyone why. People are having these ama- massive epiphanies, like I have to leave my job. Every painting was them solo in a canoe, you know, in the water, and they were working like in a corporate job in Manhattan. And it's like, I need to be in nature, I need to get away from this, and I need to do something else. Or somebody was going through like menopause and crying and mourning the loss of her fertility and painting all these pictures of reds and pinks. And I mean, it's, it, it just started coming out. And so I love that. And I love just the whole full expression of coaching. And so that's, that's how I got into the field. And then do you want to know how I got into the dating and relationship part? Yes, I can well, tell you, you, that were, part. you were, you know, <laughs> what I think is like, our, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot is the, what our experience is turns out to be usually our gift because yeah. we become experienced in it. And so we can help other people with it. And so, and that's one of the things that I thought about when I really decided I wanted to help people at a deeper level and in their whole life, not just their health and fitness, because that's where I started coaching, um, mm-hmm. is I started to think about maybe I should have a thing where I help people reconnect with their old flames. So that was a thought (laughs) that I had because I have experience in it. Not everything's going to be a success, right? But, you know, I would would have had some success connecting people. And it's funny because my aunt had reconnected with an old boyfriend years, years later. They actually had a baby together that they gave up for adoption. So it's like, it was like in my family. And then then I kind of like repeated it, although I didn't have a baby with him. And it's like, hey, hey, are these things happening in my family? Because that's like a direction I'm supposed to go in. Uh, So yeah, it's kind of uh, interesting that, you know, you, the path led you there and now you have this experience in it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That's almost like a genetic DNA thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, and I told you a little bit about my reconnection with my uh, high oh, yeah, school Yeah, that's boyfriend. right. You did. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so she, we should tell, you tell the story, but we could, we should also point my, mm. my interview on your podcast hasn't come out yet. I think it's going to come out. You said November. Yeah. Uh, but we'll, yeah, we'll actually add that link to the show notes once it airs. But yeah, yeah she, so yeah, tell me, tell the audience about yeah, that. Yeah, I'll tell that one quick and then yeah. I'll tell yeah, you how I got quick. into my industry. Yeah. So yeah, this, there was a guy who was like my lifetime love from 16 to 21. 
And finally I got over him and I moved on. And then as my, I was divorcing, I had reached out to him and I, I just out of curiosity to find out if he ever loved me and if I was his first, you know, we had sex the first time for me and was it the first for him? And I had no idea about any of this because we never really talked about any of the deep stuff, but we had like this very strong chemical connection. And yeah, it was, it was interesting. He, he ended up marrying late in life. He was still married at the time. Then he said he would never get divorced and he did a few years later. So we did reconnect. He lived across the country. He came back to see family and he came over like Thanksgiving morning several years ago. And he had been studying Tantra and he had this whole plan that we were, I didn't go into this on the podcast, but he had this whole plan that we were going to like explore with Tantra sex. And, and meanwhile, I was dating somebody at the time who kept the relationship open He because he knew I had just started dating at the time. And he said, I'm not going to make you, you know, commit to me because he didn't want to make me feel trapped, but he had committed to me right away. So it was this weird, like he was committed, I wasn't committed, I was still exploring, but I felt weird about it because I did have a physical relationship with the other guy. Anyway, we were about to go to a, like a hotel, like he had the whole thing planned. <laughs> and he came over that, that Thursday morning and it was just like, I don't feel a connection. I feel like we never really had a deep connection. So I, I was so ambivalent about the whole thing. And then Saturday night when we were supposed to get together at this hotel, he called me and told me he had a bad back and he was going to have to cancel. So I called the other guy and said, come over. Yeah. <laughs> and like 20 minutes later, I hear from the ex-boyfriend and he says, I'm, I'm feeling a lot better. I bet that's stuff. better. I'm coming over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, sorry, it's not going to work out. I already have the other guy coming. And that was it. We never talked again. It was just like, I, I, yeah, so it was not a success, but it was, it was interesting. And it, yeah. And I think that you, it's good because you close that door. Yeah. So, and that's what I, I, you know, we, we didn't go into a lot of depth, you know, with my situation and how I was kind of feeling at the time. But I remember very clearly that the, the way I describe it is the door always was cracked. You know, they, he never, he was always in my mind, always in that, that was a, an unsolved you know, opening. And so mm -hmm. it's either like, I need to open the door and see, and then close it for good. Or I need to <laughs> open the door and then walk through. And yeah. so, you know, that's the best description. And so now that door was closed and I love that. Yeah. And, and there was another guy that I had sort of an open crack with, but that would never work out either. But it, you know, it is interesting to, to look back and especially like when when you get frustrated with dating with online dating or whatever you're doing and then you think back well you know i had a connection let's see what's there yeah yeah and it's interesting yeah. too because the way you describe it, it i can sense that there wasn't that you know there was that physical connection but there wasn't that like soul connection type yeah. of thing and i think you, sometimes we confuse the two right and i the, the person i'm married to now we had that soul deep i never have felt that soul deep connection with anyone and we mm -hmm. we had that we talked in depth about a lot of different things which probably made our breakup even more painful for me and that memory so vivid of you know and keeping yeah. him kind of never wanting to relinquish that from my mind because I, yeah. I had it once and i didn't want to let it go and, you know, when you don't have it again, you're missing it. And so wanting to have that connection is, is a real thing. And, and you know, it's people... possible. Right, exactly. And it, 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 it's important to experience it, whether it does happen again it, with the same person or not, you know what, you have a felt sense of what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so here's my trajectory after the divorce. So, so one of the good things that happened during the divorce is my husband started to get help. He really did not communicate his feelings. He would walk away from any difficult conversation. And I think because I was so clear that this relationship is not, it's just never going to be okay. And I am so done. He, it was almost like an anvil over the head. I, I describe it that way because it, it was like up until that point, no matter what I would say, it didn't matter. It was like, you're the problem. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm never doing the work. And so he realized, oh, I, I could use some help. And so he studied nonviolent communication, 
which is something that I really valued because it broke down how to deal in conflict, how to get out of judgment and how to really describe what's really going on without any of the other garbage in the way. And then how to really identify your feelings, your needs, and then have a conversation from that point. And so it made the end of our marriage, like probably the best three years of our marriage. And my kids were so confused because now mom and dad are walking every day together and talking everything out. And I said, yeah, we're getting along, which is great for you, but it's not going to save this marriage. But I ended up applying those skills to my client practice. And so it's part of my arsenal of tools. And so I started with midlife career change. That was sort of what was going on for me. So I was coaching men and women around midlife career change and and then I, I started walking with a friend who was dating a couple of years before I was, and she was such a mess with her dating life. And she would say things to me like, yeah, this guy I'm seeing told me he's really not able to have a relationship right now. He's not available for that. What do you think he really means? And I'm like, he meant what he said. Why are you <laughs> interpreting that? It was so obvious to me. What that do you want him to say that he's right, not going to exactly. say? Never say. <laughs> And, you know, it wasn't so uncommon to, you know, overthink and to misinterpret and not pay attention to signs. She had been married to a, a very narcissistic man. And so she had a lot of fears. And so her, her online profile was vague. Her pictures were blurry and <laughs> in the dark. I mean, she really was hiding. And I started working with her. I rewrote her profile and I said, you got to post better pictures and you got to stop ignoring what men say and she started to have success and so I said okay this is interesting I, I didn't know it was a career I just had fun doing it and then I started doing it more and more and realized that this is something I love because I also need to learn these skills because I didn't know what I was doing when I started dating again and so that that's how it got started it was about two years into my coaching uh, certification I decided to focus on on that. And then the woman of value piece came up because I realized the piece I loved the most about coaching women was helping them be more empowered. And I said, you know, I'm just like, I don't really love the whole, like, you know, how to flirt better. That stuff is not really my thing. It's more about empowered communication and not missing red flags and setting boundaries. And we need to do that in our entire life. Well, also, um, nobody likes a disempowered man. So what, why would you think that a man would like a disempowered woman? You know, you want empowerment is sexy, is attractive. And right. so give somebody that gift mm. of feeling that and they're going to be a magnet. Yeah, exactly. And so then you start taking all of these stupid rules and throwing them out the window and stop trying to fold yourself into a twisted pretzel to you know accommodate other people which is what I did most of my life to keep the peace and be the people pleaser and so that's that's a, what led me to the boundary work that I do because codependency is huge um, people are very anxious in dating and I was and you know and so learning who you are and how you operate uh, and so you can really change it and be more in alignment with who you're supposed to be changes everything and it makes everything in your life just better I mean yeah. I'm doing a video this week on non-attachment in dating because we attach to the outcome and then we just go in with one goal and it has to be look look like this and then we miss all the good stuff and we don't, we don't see dating as a, an experience and an opportunity to grow and to meet new people and to be better at communicating. And, to, you know, there's just so many things that we can benefit from. Yeah. You know, I just had this thought and it, it, what made what, what you said made me think about when you go into a first date with somebody you always have this expectation of a second date, right? There's a hope of the second date. You're already like jumping to a future that may not happen. So why don't you just forget, like like detach from that desired outcome and just be in the present moment and experience that present moment. And exactly. yeah. I don't know what, yeah. Because like what, if, what if you don't like the person? You don't want a second exactly. date. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and we're so used to just hoping to be liked and hoping to be chosen rather than we actually get to choose and we get to come in and not only show up as our best and try to take all the masks off, but also decide whether we want to keep seeing that person or not. I mean, it's, we both are a choice. Yeah. So and with, with some of the datelines I've seen, you kind of want to like watch for those red flags. So yes, many people see them and then they ignore them. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah so totally. what exactly does last first date mean to you? Mm. So the last first date is, is really the whole point of dating is not to keep dating. <laughs> it's to stop dating and get into a relationship. And I think people get stuck in that dating process of it's all about getting the date and then the next date. The point is get offline. If you're meeting people online, get into dates and get into relationships because that's really how we grow as people and start looking for the good in people and not just all the criticism because the more we grow and, and learn to honor ourselves, the more we can honor the other person. So the last first date is really about being in a relationship and it doesn't have to look like marriage or living together. It can look a lot of different ways, but it's just like get off that dating hamster wheel and <laughs> start having relationships. Yeah, definitely. So. It's yeah, it's more of a, you know, the goal is to not have to ever go on a date again and but kind of approach it in that way. Yeah, I mean, you're going to date the person you're in a relationship with, but you're not just going to keep going on these first and second dates that just lead to people just feeling disappointed. And, you know, I used to go into dates in my 20s hoping each one was the one. I mean, it was like if it wasn't, it was a total disappointment. And, if somebody fixed me up with somebody and thought that person was for me, what is wrong with them? And what, what do they think of me? And, you know, it's just that all these limiting beliefs that we have instead of thank you for thinking of me and, you know, it wasn't a great fit, but, you know, on to the next one until you get into relationships. And what I see people doing so often is just spending so much time studying relationship and learning how to communicate and learning all the skills, but not applying them. The only school you need to be in is the school of relationships, really, because when you're with the right partner, you grow so much, you, you're challenged, you, you, know, you learn to put your ego aside, you really have the opportunity to become the best version of yourself if you're in the right relationship. Yeah. And I guess if you're staying in the cycle of dating, 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 you got to say like, you know, look inward, right? Like yeah. what, what is there, there's some sort of like, you not that you shouldn't want what you want, but at what point are you like making it? So, you know, like you're making it not available to you because you have some kind of stringent guidelines and that would never be met. Right. Or you're, you're just not speaking up and you're writing people off so quickly. So I, mm. I spoke to a potential client the other day and she was so rigid about, you know, her requirements and very kind of bitter about the whole dating process. And I said, so what would you do if a man was on a date with you and he wouldn't stop talking? So she goes, oh God, I would just like roll my eyes and I would just you know, pray for the date to end as soon as possible, because obviously he's a jerk. <laughs> so, I mean, that was the tone. And I said, so what if there was another way to look at that? What if he was nervous? What if, because you didn't interrupt him or let him know that he was talking too much in a kind way and set some boundaries that you never got to know who he really was. And you've been writing off all these men who really could be amazing people. Oh, but men, they should just know. Well, no, people don't just know things. So it's, it's like, get out of your own way and stop assuming everything and check in with people. I, I, you know, and, and there's just all these the damn rules. It's like, you know, where people think, oh, women never change. Men, men should chase me and I'll never make first moves. And, you know, ask them. Wasn't there a rule book? Like, wasn't, yes, what was that rule book? I remember there's a rule. called the rules. The rules. <laughs> Yes. And my new client told me that her 
one of her siblings gave her the book and I said, throw it out and burn it. <laughs> it's so it, it's set up for people who have an anxious attachment style, who, who are used to having their heart broken because they got too attached too quickly. So they take the opposite approach. I mean, this is my, my opinion. They take the opposite approach, which is women never initiate, never offer to pay, never do this, never make a man come to you, you know, just let him do all the chasing. And then guess what? He gets you. And then there's that quick bait and switch because that's not really who you are. And now you become all clingy and weird. And he's like, who is this person? So that is absolutely the opposite of what I teach, which is why I tell people don't, don't read these books. They don't teach you who you are. Yes. How to respond according to like who you are as a human and who that yeah. person is in front of you instead of saying one size fits all men should always chase. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I want the step-by-step -step process that kind of like takes away all the organic, you know, go with who you are, go with the flow. Like it makes it very um, rigid and, and clinical and yeah, not That's fun. Yeah. yeah. It's manipulative. It's mm -hmm. fake. It's not real. And Sold a lot of books though. They did. They <laughs> yeah. Because people do want step-by-step -step yeah. with everything. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. did, you did fitness. People want to know, how do I lose weight? How do I get yeah. my body in shape? Give me the rules. Yeah. And you know, even with weight loss, everybody's body is different. Not everybody is going to lose weight in the same way. And so why do we think dating is a one size fits all? Yeah. It's so good. So good. So you have a date coming up. You told me I do. <laughs> before we recorded. Do you want to share anything about that? Yeah. So there's Excited? a, yeah, he's a, he's a really cute guy. He's from England. So I just was dying to hear his accent. That's a, that's a check mark in the <laughs> exactly. like plus column, a British accent. <laughs> and he's 15 years younger and he was very, um, very articulate and paid attention to my profile, which most men don't. He was not a bot, which most men are <laughs> when you're on the dating apps. And it's so obvious they look amazing in their pictures and then their English is terrible. So this guy could actually speak English. And in our first phone call, he, he was, first of all, he was eager to get on a call right away. Very, um, he's very into music, which that's a big part of my family. My son is a musician. So I, I know a lot of weird music, like indie music. And so we had this great conversation about music. He was in a band when he was younger. And so he had passions and I need a guy with passion and with drive and energy. And so just meeting a guy who's a little bit younger, who's also full of passion who doesn't care about dating an older woman and so last night when we were planning our date he said I just have a question for you it says on your profile you're 65 is that true because you really don't look 65 I go yeah it's true he goes oh, okay I'm totally fine with that are you okay that I'm 50 I said yeah so he goes okay let's do it and he's going to drive two hours to meet me That's which nice. says a lot and um well we'll see again non-attachment like to me, I've already had two great conversations. What is the happens. piece of advice that Sandy, the coach, would give to Sandy, the person going on the date? Yeah, don't don't be attached to the outcome. It's going to be an experience. Whatever happens, happens. And um, he actually, we had a tentative date set up for the week before. And I want to share this because this is where you take the rule book and throw it out. So he had told me, we had spoken on a Thursday night and he said, can I call you tomorrow? This is a great conversation, but it was getting late. And I said, sure. He didn't call me the next day. And we had this tentative date and he never followed through. So I lived my life again, non-attachment, but I really had a great conversation with him. And I said, you know, I don't want to let this go. So I texted him and I said, you know, that it was a great conversation. And I'm just wondering you know, then there were crickets. So, you know, can you let me know if something happened? And he immediately wrote back and said, oh, my apologies. One of my kids needed me. I lost track of time. And then he said, can we talk tonight? And that was it. It was the catalyst to getting onto a date and onto a phone call. So a lot of women would just say, well, he was flaky and I don't want to date a man who can't follow through. But my experience of him is that he does follow through. And again, I didn't know what would happen. But again, non-attachment. I sent the text. 
if he didn't write back, then I, I'm not going to continue. So it, it's, it's really just follow your instincts and, and let go of all these dumb yeah. Rules. Yeah. And I like that too, because we quickly judge people based on our past experience with somebody. Right. Yeah. And so that, that immediately, you know, I, somebody did this to me. And so that, that person's is going to be the same. And exactly. so without, yeah. And so I, and, and what, what made me think is, you know, it's like a, kind of that was a one strike but in baseball there's three strikes right before <laughs> exactly. you're out so yeah. what's like one is like you sh should yeah. be permissible people have emergencies right I love yeah. that I love examples that's so helpful right and there was a part of me that wanted to say you know I'm a woman of value and you need to let me know and that I really want a man who's accountable and how to work through all of that and keep it really kind and just connecting and it was it was the perfect text because it got him to apologize. And, you know, if I had reprimanded him, that would not have been good. But we have a tendency to want to do that, to want to school people and let them know, you know, you don't treat me like that. I'm not in a relationship with this guy. If we were in a relationship and he did some dick move, I would say something to him like, that's not okay with me. Yeah. It's also, you put, you, you're, you led with curiosity. And you exactly. can learn something from that. Like what, what happened? What, because maybe if he said something that actually happened, then mm -hmm. you can take that forward and prevent it from happening again. So I like that you led for like, how can I learn from this? Like what, what, what did I do? What did, you know, what happened with the conversation? It seemed good to me. So yeah. I like that. It was a curiosity approach instead of a pissed off approach. Yeah. Curiosity is so important and not to jump to conclusions and think we know anything about another person. I mean, but so many of us have been wounded, you know, by relationships. Yeah, and wounded. so we go in there with those open wounds and it's like, yeah, you know. I mean, I have had so many men find out who I was just from my first name and the fact that I'm a coach. I don't tell them I'm a dating coach because I don't want them to get into that conversation. I just say I'm a life coach and I tell them where I live and they find me. And one guy came to a date with a list of all the things that he found out about me. It was the creepiest thing. He, he was like, your children's names are, you live at, you, and he didn't have my address, which was good. But it was like, what the hell are you doing? He said, I'm really mad at you. I stayed up till really late last night because I found you on the web and then I kept finding things about you. And so there are men who won't ask me out because they find out I'm a dating coach and they're like, well, I don't want you to coach me. And so they make an assumption about me when I'm out there dating like anyone else and I'm looking for a man who will add value to my life and I will not stay in a relationship that doesn't. So I've been in some great relationships since my divorce, better than ever before, but there was something missing in each one of them that did not lead to a life partnership. So they were there for a season and a reason. <laughs> and, uh, and then it's like, now I've, I'm so completely selective about who I'll date more than once or yeah. twice because well, I, my time is valuable. Energy is valuable. Yeah. I'm very eager. I was jumping to the gun before you finished. I'm very eager to hear how your date goes. So you'll have to keep me posted. <laughs> I will. <laughs> you'll have to keep me posted. Yes. So, so I love, so since this podcast is not your average lives and I look for people who are not average uh, or living a not your average life because uh, they've chosen, they've made that choice. So I would love to know from you, what, what do you think of when you hear what a not your average life what does it mean to you? And then how do you exemplify that? I think to me, it's not settling for the status quo, not believing that your life is because you were brought up this way. You came from this kind of family. You married into this life. You have a job and it's hard to leave. It's taking these emotional risks to really live a life that's bigger that's more aligned with who you are instead of settling for the life that somebody else chose for you maybe. And so, yeah, it's people who actually make those scary choices because they don't wanna be stuck and they don't want to live outside of their authentic self. Yeah, I love that. I love that, not settling uh, and yeah, being, being a little bit brave. 
exploring mm. outside the comfort comfort zone a little bit. Yeah, I love that. So yeah. so true. Well, thank you so much for joining. I think we went a little bit longer because I forgot to set my timer. So, but that's okay. It was so interesting. I was uh, like intrigued. I was sitting like on the edge of my seat. <laughs> so that was so a much. great conversation. Thank yes, you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being so open uh, about your past life, your current life and what's going on. It's, it's great. It's great to see somebody like so uh, out there and, and not afraid. To, to date new people and meet new people. So that's great. Yeah, it's scary. Uh, I would say it's, it's like fear walking, you know, instead of fearless, because I think a lot of people think that's the goal. No fear and feel the fear, do it anyway. <laughs> that's quotable quote. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own, not your average life. Thank you.